Um, I'm Barbara Bogard, and I'm on this up here because um, I'm going to tell you about my perspective and my experience organizing a local grassroots community-based campaign to reduce and hopefully eliminate the use of pesticides in the community where I live, which is Marin County. And um, certainly I didn't do this alone. There's people in the room uh, who worked with me. Uh, you know, it's a de these campaigns always take a village, as they say, and this one is no exception. Um, and the work that we did really rests we stand on the shoulders, in fact, of people who have been doing this work in Marin County for over 20 years. And one of them is standing right there behind the camera, Ginger Sodders Mason, who is really, uh, you know, none of this would be possible without her. Uh, probably, what, 20 years ago, 1998, one of the things that happened in Marin County was uh, from the work that Ginger and her friends did, we, um, Marin County adopted an IPM ordinance, and then from that we got our IPM commission. And those two things are fundamental to the work that we do today. The other thing that happened back then, in 2004, Marin County adopted um, the precautionary principle uh, in its uh, what's, what they say is that um, the precautionary principle will be used, at, the county says, will be used as a guide for policy making and operations. And so that's something we rely on quite heavily too in Marin County. Um, as in every campaign that you, I mean I'm an organizer, that's what I do. And in every organizing campaign, the first thing you have to do is put together your team of people who are going to work. Um, and there are, you know, you put together a group of maybe six or eight people who are going to really do the day-to-day -day heavy lifting. And then there are concentric circles of more and more people you can rely on to show up for bigger events and who will come speak when you need them to or come hold a sign or whatever. And that's certainly one thing that we did right away. The other thing you have to be clear about is who your target audience is. Who is it, in, in this case what we had to look at is who has the power to make the decisions about pesticide use in Marin County. And um, it, there's several layers of who makes those decisions. One big group is the uh, what we call our Board of Supervisors, five elected people who um, decide what happens on the land that the county owns and manages. There's also the Board of Directors of the Water District because they decide what happens on the land that on the watershed land in Marin County. And then there's that IPM commission that I mentioned, and there's also staff of parks and open space. And they have a lot to say about what happens uh, in terms of pesticide use in Marin County. So it seems to me that if you're targeting people in power, you have two choices. You can either try to educate um, and then convince the people who are in power to do what you want them to, which in this case is, you know, reduce and ban pesticides. And if you absolutely can't do that, your other option is to try and replace them with people who do support your position. And we used both of those tactics. Um, many people in this room helped us elect um, about three and a half years ago, one of our friends to the Marin Municipal Water District uh, Water Board, the Board of Directors. And he shouldn't have won that election. He was definitely the underdog in the campaign, but he did. 
And one of the main reasons he did is because he ran on the issue of no herbicides in the watershed. And that was important enough to people in Marin County that he won that election. And that had a couple of really important um, influences on what happened from then out in Marin County. Not only did it give us, um, help us create a policy for an herbicide-free watershed, but it put every elected person in Marin County on notice that that was an issue that people cared enough about that it would swing an election. And I think that really changed things in Marin too. We had other um, elected strategies. Uh, we made pesticide use since then. We've made it an election issue. So for instance, we've gone to, whenever anybody's running for anything, they debate. I always go and I sit in the audience and ask a question. If you're elected, will you fight for no pesticides? Um, is this something that you're willing to run on? And then we make it clear that we'll support them and help their candidacy if they support the issue that we care about. So that's another way that we have changed who's in office. The other thing that we do is um, when there are openings on things like the IPM Commission, we're always, we tr try our best to get our people to apply for those seats. So those are ways that, you know, we have replace some of the people that who would never do what we wanted them to do in terms of pesticides. But we've done, we also did a lot of education and convincing people who are in office to do what we wanted them to do. And, you know, it's always in my experience about relationships. It's always fundamentally bottom line building relationships with people and so one of the I think most effective things that we've done is we had meeting after meeting after meeting with the individual supervisors we would go into their offices two or three or four of us go in and have a conversation we did that more times than I can tell you we also have individual meetings with the staff the county staff parks and open space we go to, we, we've had demonstrations. Um, Memorial Day three years ago, we got notice, very short notice, three day notice, that they were going to spray Roundup on a place that was, come in, um, really important to people in Marin County called Ring Mountain. So we went into action and we pulled together a huge team of people. We went out there. Actually, one of the things I did was I threatened civil disobedience. I said, uh, and that may be one of your tactics too. I said, uh, you're gonna, I'm gonna lie down where you're gonna spray and you're gonna have to get the authorities in to move me and the press will be there. And you know, they backed off. Um, they said, don't embarrass us like that, I said. That, that was their response. Don't embarrass us like that, I said. Don't do it then. So they backed off, but we still had a big demonstration there. We took everybody out early in the morning, handed out leaflets, had signs. We still got on the front page of the newspaper. And that brought more and more people in, made them aware of what was going on in Marin County and brought them to work with us. Um, we also have attended every IPM commission meeting and spoken during open time. We've attended board of supervisors meeting after meeting after meeting. You can always, it's wonderful, California Brown Act, you can always speak during open time. And we took great advantage of that one. Uh, I go to the parks and open space. I mean, I go to, really, we go to a lot of meetings. But it's effective. People know you're there. Um, we also wrote letters to the editors. We wrote letters to the supervisors. We uh, got the support from other environmental groups when we could and got them to 
pressure with us. We have used social media. We have a Facebook group. We have two Facebook groups. We have Facebook pages. We use Nextdoor. Um, just recently, uh, I was at a meeting of the IPM Commission, and a friend of ours came up to me afterwards and said, can, we had a big decision. We won something, which I'll tell you about in a minute. She said, can I do a f live stream f of you on Facebook? I said, sure. She put it on Facebook. Now, this is her connections. It has now been view viewed close to 40,000 times. And Ginger's on it, too. Ginger and I are both talking. It's been shared a thousand times. So, you know, that's another way that you can reach people these days, and you have to use whatever you can use. Um, one of the key lessons for us in doing this work was the importance of providing alternatives. If you're asking people not to use pesticides, you really have to help them solve whatever problem they thought they were solving with pesticides in a non-toxic way. So we've done research about alternatives. We've brought in, you know, connected them with a shepherd who could come in with his goats and sheep. Um, we've done all kinds of, oh, you know, since pesticide-free management, obviously, um, is more labor intensive. We've worked on crea creating groups of volunteers who will go out and pull the weeds by hand. In fact, there's one group that um, some of you in the room know. Uh, we have a group of people who, he's one of our best volunteers. He goes out with a group of people every Thursday week after week for five years now. They call themselves Broom Service, which is a great name. And they pull broom in the area where they live. And we're trying to use what he's doing as a model and communicate that to people, you know, get more and more groups in Marin County to adopt areas like that. Um, the other thing that we really found is that it's important, first of all, to understand this is going to happen incrementally. I'm somebody who really wants what I want and want it now. So this was a hard lesson for me. But you, it goes in steps. You take what you can get, and you're happy about it. You celebrate it. And the other thing that we learned to do was really, as our supervisors or whoever was making these decisions that we liked made these decisions, we, were very, we learned to praise them to congratulate them, to celebrate them. You know, every time they did the right thing, we just made them heroes. And they really like that. I mean, who doesn't like that? We like that too. So that was one of the things we did. And those are all various tactics and that we've used in Marin County to get where we are. So where are we? Let me tell you the results of where we're at in Marin County right now. The water district, the watershed, which is uh, 21,635 acres, managed without the use of herbicides at all. Um, the parks, then there's parks and open space. Um, parks, this is, I, I have some of these. I can connect you with this if you want to see. This is the uh, integrated pest management report from 2017 from our parks department. And it's a real tribute to how far they've come. They are patting themselves on the back and glorifying the fact that they use such little pesticide. Okay? So, for instance, uh, oh, here. One of the first statements, conventional pesticide use decreased 86% over the previous year. And they weren't using a lot the previous year. And then you look at the titles of these, of their pages. Um, in 2017, Marin County maintained 147 locations, including 126 without pesticides. They're thrilled. 
in 2017, Marin County IPM program used zero glyphosate-based products. Uh, Marin County is committed to rodenticide-free IPM. So over and over again, you see how we have changed their consciousness. They're proud of the fact that they don't use pesticides, and that's a really big deal. Um, when we first went to them suggesting that they not use something, they uh, weren't happy with us. Um, but, you know, they've come along. They've really come along. And the big victory that we had just la last month, February, was um, the supervisor, it was recommended by the IPM Commission, and then the supervisors voted that as of 2018, glyphosate comes off of the approved pesticide list for, yeah, for all land that's um, managed, that comes under the IPM ordinance. So that's all of our parks, that's medians, that's county buildings. That was a big victory, and we did celebrate that one. Um, we also work with open space. In Marin County, they make a distinction between parks and open space. Open space still uses some pesticides, but they're moving in the right direction. They're also um, moving away from pesticides, and we meet with them, and they give us a list now. They've agreed to give us a list of everywhere they think they might want to use pesticides in the following, in the upcoming year, so we can have a conversation about it and suggest alternatives. So that's, you know, we're really moving in the right direction. And the other really uh, success story that we have in Marin is something called Yard Smart Marin, which is uh, amazing, okay? It's um, one of the things that the supervisors used to say to us was, and it's true, most of the pesticide use in Marin, I'm sure this is true everywhere, is used by the people who live there, not by the county. So we said, yeah, okay, you're right. Help us teach the people who live here then not to use pesticides and also be a model for their not using pesticides. So uh, they gave us originally $100,000 to um, do a two-year campaign in Marin County to teach the people who live and work there not to use pet, why they shouldn't use pesticides and what they could do instead. That actually, we got another 40,000 on top of that, and then we work with this wonderful um, marketing agency out of Jack London Square. They're terrific, women-owned, women-led, and they brought a grant with them of 92000 So we ended up with really not much under a quarter of a million dollars um, for a campaign. The first year's campaign was uh, a weed killer, and we had these cards. These were in movie theaters, the newspaper, bus terminals, called Think Before You Spray, Put Weed Killer Away. And um, this was quite effective. We spent a year on this campaign. Now we're starting the second year of Yard Smart Marin. Um, and we'll be targeting rodenticides for the first part of the year. And then we're going after insecticides. So, and that's all, you know, on money that the county allocated to do this. So that's another really wonderful piece of the progress toward a pesticide-free environment in Marin County. Um, if I can give you one word um, about how to do this wherever you are, it would be persistence. Persistence. Perseverance. Um, you never lose if you never give up. And that's what we found. It's been going on for years. We just don't ever give up. You know, I was thinking this morning, um, my parents used to complain a lot about how stubborn I was as a child. 
And I think what I've done is just figure out as an adult how to turn that into a virtue. So that's what we're doing. We never give up. Um, if you live in a community where you want to see that happen, where you live, there are plenty of people in this room and elsewhere. We're willing to help you, um, to you know, guide you, to suggest ways that you can help achieve the same success in Marin, that uh, same success in your counties or cities or wherever you live that we've achieved in Marin. So thank you. Well, I was not, I, I confess that I did not prepare for a long talk tonight. I was told that other people were doing that and I would be adding 15 minutes here and there. So I will just give you a summary of uh, our activism. Uh, I work with, with uh, farm workers and farm workers have a life expectancy of only 49 years. And this has always disturbed me, and I think one of the key causes is their overexposure to pesticides. Uh, I have farm workers calling me from the field, telling me that they're being sprayed or the spraying is going on right near them and they feel nauseous or whatever, at which point I call the agricultural commissioner and they send out a crew to investigate. But the point being that the laws that are supposed to protect farm workers in the field are not enforced and it takes somebody from the outside to uh, be active and insist that they not be subjected to this. And uh, uh, most farm workers where in the Central Valley are so afraid of losing their job and being blacklisted that they won't complain. So uh, I've kind of become the ad hoc <laughs> advocate on their behalf with this. But I uh, have been so uh, concerned about pesticides and farm workers that uh, we are now, my organization is now partnered with Californians for Pesticide Reform. And <clears throat> we have developed um, an organization within our two organizations called Safe Ag, Safe Schools. And one of our biggest concerns is the use of pesticides around children uh, in the Central Valley. And so we have targeted two particular pesticides. One is glyphosate. And I should mention that in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley where I live, I live in Felton, uh, there was practically a war over glyphosate at the water district because uh, we had French broom everywhere on the hillsides. Everyone knew we had to get rid of it. And one suggestion was that we cut, cut the stem and then put a ring of glyphosate around the cambium level so it can't sprout back. And a lot of people were up in arms about that. I was very happy to see how many people in my community don't want any glyphosate at all. And so I offered at the meeting and in the local newspaper a crew of farm workers to take care of the French broom. And um, it's interesting, they, they backed down after that. So what, once you come up with a solution, then, <laughs> then there's a tendency to not keep pushing your, your uh, environmentally um, detrimental solution. So um, in terms of glyphosate, uh, we, you probably are aware that it is a, um, at least through the OEHA, do you know about, a, uh, what is it, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, it's a Prop 65 carcinogen. And yet, we continue to sell Roundup to the general public, and glyphosate, for those of you who weren't aware, is the active ingredient. And this uh, chemical, glyphosate, creates all kinds of cancers and liver, liver diseases, and I mean, there's a whole litany. And I think that at the very least, the public has a right to know that this stuff can make them sick and possibly kill them. And there's no warning on these, uh, on the labeling, or there's no labels on these Roundup containers. 
Uh, I've had a war going on with the local Santa Cruz Costco managers now <laughs> for at least five years, and so far this year there has not appeared any roundup on the shelves. So, <laughs> no, I'm not saying it won't happen. Every time I go in there I hold my breath, but Anyway, uh, what I did, I was so concerned about this and the fact that I think the general public has a right to know. Also, my neighbor got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He was deathly ill from the treatment, and it cost the insurance company $759,000. And I had this image. This is terrible. I guess it's the, it's the what is it, the shadow mind or something. <laughs> of the pharmaceutical industry getting together with the agrochemical industry and saying, we'll give them cancer and you, you can cure them and we'll all get rich. You know, and I, I hope that's not true, but I've, I've become so cynical in my old age, who knows. But anyway, I had these uh, stickers made and I have plenty here for anybody who'd like to take some. I invite you to join me. Um, they say, uh, warning, contains cancer-causing agent known to kill bees. And all you do is just put it in some obscure area, and then you can just peel this off and slap it right on the Roundup containers. So <laughs> any of you who like these, we have all different colors even. So, yeah, maybe pass them around or whatever. So... Um, Anyway, that's one of our, and I think, what is it? It's 1.1 million pounds of this stuff that are used in this country. It's the most widely used uh, herbicide in the world today. I mean, this is disgraceful that we're doing this to the environment. So we must shut this down. Now, on a positive note, my daughter, who uh, um, has two grandbabies, my two grandbabies, uh, she lives up in Windsor, which is north of Santa Rosa, very conservative uh, tract kind of area. And she said, and so she's always, as, as she grew up, she would always look at me and my activism and say, oh, mom, you know, like, why are you doing this and stuff? Well, then she had her two grandbabies and walked out her front door in Windsor. She says, mom, they spray everywhere. I feel like I'm under house arrest. So she met an environmental engineer up there, and she, they both went and talked to the mayor, and the mayor wanted evidence. So I sent her a whole raft of um, reports about the toxicity of this stuff, and she passed it on. And uh, I told her also that I would supply a crew of farm workers to deal with the weeds if they wanted. And so we're waiting to hear what the response, but the mayor is bought over. So she's on their side now. She says she just has to convince whoever they hire or whatever they do for, uh, but, but Rosa, my daughter, says that everywhere you go, even the children's playground, they have this stuff, even where the kids are playing. So that's, that's one semi-success story. And then another one uh, that we did with our Safe Ag, Safe Schools is we went to the Pajaro Union Valley, what is it, Pajaro Union School District board meeting. And we wanted them to stop using glyphosate in Santa Cruz. So we had signs and everything, and I took a raft of the same reports and I gave them to the secretary. She made copies for everybody and passed them out to all the board members. And we all made statements. And at the end of the meeting, they voted. And they voted not to use it anymore. Yay! <laughs> Isn't that great? I was so happy. I couldn't sleep that night. It was great. Um, so that's, that's kind of the work we're doing with glyphosate. Now, our, my biggest concern and where I have the most energy is with chlorpyrifos. I mean, I am really sick and tired of chlorpyrifos because what I have seen, uh, in my opinion, is the worst example of environmental racism I've ever studied, and I'm a PhD environmental scientist. 
And what it is is that if you read the Chamaco scientists report uh, from UC Berkeley, they did a 17 year study of mothers and children in the Salinas Valley. And they use a lot of organophosphates in the Salinas Valley, including chlorpyrifos. And they found that for every 522 pounds of organophosphate that a pregnant woman is exposed to, once her fetus, within a kilometer, okay, uh, once the fetus is born, once it reaches age seven, it will have lost 2.2 points of IQ. And some of the women in that valley are exposed to thousands of pounds of this stuff. So now the kids grow up, they're already intellectually deficient. And so then they go to the surrounding schools, which are right near the school, right near the fields. And this stuff tends to drift. It's drift prone, as they say. So they spray this insecticide, chlorpyrifos. It moves through the fields into the classrooms and disrupts the normal development of the brain and spinal cord of these kids. So now these kids are getting hit two, twice, both in the womb and also in their classroom. And that's where the safe school, safe ag, safe school, or SAS as we call it, came from. So we have had, uh, chlorpyrifos was scheduled for uh, elimination uh, across the entire United States as of March 31st. Uh, 2017. And then we had Trump elected and he appointed Scott Pruitt to be the EPA director and Scott Pruitt got together with the Dow executives and reversed the ban. I know. I was just absolutely livid. And so we held a press conference in Salinas and I'll never forget, I spoke, and I'll never forget my final sentence. I have no idea where it came from, by the way. You know how that goes. But I, I remember saying at the very end, are your profits really worth the compromised brains of our children? And that's what it really comes down to. So uh, we have been up to, uh, it, was, it wasn't listed anymore. There was no listing. And one of SAS's goals is to eliminate chlorpyrifos from the state. If we can't have it nationally, then at least get rid of it from the state. So we went up to OEHA and we gave a presentation to the scientists. And I was so impressed with the quality of scientists they have on that board. If you get a chance, go and listen to one of their uh, deals where they decide what's going to be, you know, one of their meetings where they decide what's going to be listed and so on. But Dow Chemical was there. They had a toxicologist, an attorney, and then just a general representative. And I noticed that the scientists weren't really paying much attention. I mean, they were kind of looking down and stuff. And then when we got up and spoke, they were very interested. And then they voted, and they voted to list it. So that was really exciting. So every month in Watsonville, we have mostly teachers, farmers, but we always have uh, human rights people. We have a large, diverse group of people that are concerned about this stuff in the environment, pesticides in general. And then uh, we, they had another group in Salinas, also meets once a month. And only recently they established one in Greenfield. So the goal, and maybe in Marin this would be good, uh, the goal is to have these uh, SAS organizations all throughout the state and start really putting public pressure on the elimination of pesticides. I personally, having all the reading I did for my doctorate and everything, there's at least three excellent studies that show that if we converted industrial agriculture to agroecological regenerative agriculture overnight, that we could feed the entire human species and mitigate climate change by 30 to 40 percent. So it's madness to continue in this industrial agricultural model because it's not working. It's really undercutting the base of our very survival, 
we have lost 50% of the wild animals on this planet since 1970. And it's not just pesticides, but still, that has to be, pl be playing a part. So um, I think that we need to simultaneously work on the elimination of these horrible chemicals while we demand a new agricultural model that is, is sustainable and is not a failure. The only, you know, I do this lecture up at UC Santa Cruz to the freshman class and we go through all the groups, consumers, farmers, the environment, and the agro industry, and the only winner is the agro industry. Everybody else loses in this model. So it's an unsustainable, uh, failed model, basically, and we need something new. So thank you for your attention.